Well, hi again, Phil Simborg for the USBGF, and I've got a, uh, a guest commentator with me today, uh, Mary Hickey, who has joined me before, and I hope will join me many times in the future. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Mary, one of the top uh, players in the world and a lecturer and writer. And um, it's interesting, it, uh, I started doing lectures uh, last year called The Last Man Standing, and I had to change the name of my lecture after the first two to The Last Man or Mary Standing because she kept winning the darn thing and kept proving that I was being way too sexist to call it The Last Man Standing. So Mary started impressing me uh, directly by winning all of my uh, uh, all of my competitions that I was holding, and uh, as a result, I have uh, gone, come to rely on her opinion quite a bit in interesting situations. So here we are in an interesting situation. It's a match that I was playing, and uh, the score is I had uh, I had zero, and my opponent had three. So I'm five away, and my opponent's two away, and I am on roll, and my opponent's holding the cube, and I rolled a six-one. And in the process of studying this and discussing it, uh, I also considered uh, how to play a 6-2. I thought the two roles were both very interesting roles when I was looking at trying to figure out the best way to play a 6-1. I wanted to figure out how to play other roles as well. So my question to you, before we hear Mary's analysis and see the answer, is how would you play a 6-1? And then also, how would you play a 6-2? So give it a little bit of thought, and then we'll let Mary... Uh, give her comments, and we'll see what's right. Now, obviously, I'll make it easy for you. You can make the five-point, or you can hit loose um, with either play. Well, with the 6-2, yeah, you, with either play, you can make the five-point, or you can choose to hit loose. And, of course, if you hit loose, there are options uh, as to how you do that. Okay, I hope I've given you enough time to make a horrible, terrible decision, just as I did, uh, at least in one of those two cases. And now I'll just be quiet and leave it up to Mary. Mary, it's all yours. Thank you, Phil. And, uh, well, this, uh, as I was pointing out to Phil when he first showed it to me, this is a wonderful example of that famous backgammon principle that the five point is the five point, except when it isn't. And, uh, well, so we obviously could make the five point with either of these roles. And uh, we also have to consider the strength of the alternative in both cases. And But of course, there's one thing we have to look at first, and that's the match score. Now, we uh, definitely want to get a gammon here. We want one more than usual, but less than we would at, at gammon go. Now, if, if you depending on what match equity table you're using, you're going to come in at around 0.7 for your gammon value, so it's kind of in the middle. But you don't need to know that over the board. You just got to know that a gammon is juicier than usual. You really would like to carry out this blitz, even though it's a little on the thin side. And so you're going to look at, how can I maximize my chances of doing that? I've got a good start by having one of his checkers up. And in the case of the 6-1, we can see that uh, it's really pretty uh, good to uh, make the, the five point. It's uh, If he doesn't enter, We've got three, uh, can we put it on final so they see how nice this looks? You've got, uh, your, this is the best use of your thin little blitz. You're a little bit overrun here, but if he doesn't get in, he can uh, get in a lot of trouble because you've got three ways to hit him, and you're not terribly well blocked on the other side of the board. That checker being seven away from your anchor is bad if you end up having to play from the anchor, but it's not so bad if you're trying to just get out. And another factor that uh, could matter quite a bit is that if he does hit you here, say he does roll out 1-6 or, you know, the 4-3 or whatever, and uh, whacks you from the bar, you might get your blitz back on track by whacking that checker he's got on his ace point. Ace point checkers are evil. You really don't want to dump checkers there if you can possibly help it, as I'm sure you know. But uh, really think hard before you do. Even if you think you have to, maybe you don't. And uh, he's going to be sorry that checker's there if it does get picked up. And okay, so, for, the, for the sake of a comparison, let's see how the hitting play looks and tell us why uh, we know that it's technically wrong because Extreme Gavin says so. But yes. what's wrong with this play? It's, uh, well, among other things, it fails to make the five point and it uh, doesn't 
get uh, any other benefits. We've got now an overrun position that's even more overrun than it was before if things start to slide on you. You have no guarantee you're going to cover that point, and you don't have anything else uh, going that's uh, good for you. You're not really getting any benefit for the fact that you gave up the five point. The splits is too thin. Okay, let me, let me add something here. If your goal is, of course, you want your goal is to win the game, but it's also to win more gammons. And if you are playing a blitzing game, one of your major goals is to stop your opponent from anchoring. And when you make the five point, the only anchor is a four or a one three. So that's 13 numbers. When you make this play, of course, there's much less chance that Blue's going to anchor. He has to roll doubles to anchor on the next roll. But there are more... In the long run, he may anchor even more because even if he doesn't roll a four, he could now roll a five or a one. And like Mary said, you might not cover it even if you do. Now he rolls another five or a one. So the odds of anchoring with three open points to come in on uh, might even be better than the odds of anchoring here. And usually if you've got a very strong blitz, you might, you're going to have a, a less odds of anchoring by hitting. But in this case, by having more points covered and not having a blot in your board that would get hit and put you back, you might actually get uh, more anchors, less anchors this way. Yeah, so we're uh, seeing that also that you've made, since you've made the five points, that's going to be good even if he does anchor. You'd like to have it. If he does succeed in anchoring, you don't want more checkers deep. You definitely uh -huh. wouldn't want him, say, to anchor on the five point, and now you're stuck with the four point behind him. You've got enough checkers behind the anchors it is. That's a great point. You're, when you're looking at these positions, you say, okay, which one is he going to anchor less on? But again, if he does anchor, you certainly would love to have your five-point. You'd love to have a four-point board. You'd love not to have another checker hit. And so whether he anchors or not, this play might be better from either standpoint. So that's what makes it really clearly superior to hitting. Can we look at the 6-2 play now, or do you want to point out some more about this one? Oh, well, we can always come back to it. I think we can look at these for money later, too, but uh, okay. you know, we might as well go with the 6-2. So, now. obviously, if it's so great to make the 5-point, then you can make the 6-point with the 5-point. Obviously, if it was right with the 6-1, it's right with the 6-2, isn't it? So I, I made that assumption, and, uh, and look at this. It's hugely wrong to make the five point with the six two. What a difference a pip makes. Yeah, it's well it's not really a pip of course. It's just uh that you've uh when you change a roll a position by one pip or a roll by one pip. We changed the roll by one pip from a six one to a six two. So yeah. that's what difference. I meant by what a difference that uh, that little I, dot on the dice makes. Right, yes, okay. Gotcha. Well this has got uh this has uh, become very interesting. We've said before that part of the problem with making the hit was that it left you so overrun. We can see this hit doesn't leave you so overrun, really, does it? But, uh, you've got that you didn't have to use your checker on the 11 point. It's still there working on the bar and working on, which you wouldn't mind maybe. It's working on the 5 point, which you really want. But best of all, you know, when we look at our pip count here, we wouldn't really mind getting the show on the road, getting out of there. We don't want to play from the anchor. As we noted before, he's on the 11 point. That's seven away. That's not helpful. But wouldn't we love to have sort of something to make up for the midpoint that we lost at some point? And so this play is a good start for that. You've distracted him. He's got two checkers up. He's still got that blot on the ace point that you might hit. And uh, now you've got a checker that on the fifth point, point that's clearly an asset to you. You could cover it and have an outpost in the outfield, which will make it hard for him to get home. And that's, of course, good. And uh, also, that checker is now only one cracker roll away of joining the blitzing group at the front. And that would make your blitz a lot scarier. It's uh, surprising what a big difference an extra checker in the fight can mean. It really moves fast. I think it was Neil Kazaros was the first person I'd say, heard say this, that uh, if you've got just eight checkers attacking, that's not scary at all. We're not frightened. And as it goes up, though, it, then it starts just to depend on how well they're arranged, if there's nine or ten. But, you know, when you start getting 11, 12, 13 checkers there, it's pretty scary. And uh, if you could get one more checker into this fight, it would be a lot scarier. Well, Mary, that's one of the reasons I got confused on the play. 
because when, I, when I'm thinking about whether or not I want to play a blitzing game or not, one of the things I do is count the checkers in the zone. And when I have, I know I need a minimum of nine usually to have a decent blitz. And if I can get 10 or 11, I probably got en enough for a good blitz. And whether I have a 6-2 or a 6-1 here, I've got more than enough to play a blitz. But in one case, it's very wrong. And in the other case, it's very right. So it's not just about the checkers in the zone. That's one of the indicators and one of the things to look at. Well, one of the big differences I see here is that with a 6-1, you couldn't uh, get a back checker moving uh, and make the five point. And, and here with the 6-2, you can, I mean, you couldn't hit and get a back checker moving too. But with the 6-2, you can accomplish two things. You can not only hit and have lots of covers and a robust game, but you can also get that back checker moving. And I did not really understand or see the value of getting these checkers going until you, until you explained it so beautifully. And there's one other factor, too, if your, your Chouette buddies still aren't convinced, and that is that if you were to make the, if you show the final position after you make the five point, in this case, it's not as good as it was last time. Builders aren't well arranged as they were last time or continuing to whack if he just stays out. Before, you had twos, threes, and fours. And here, you don't have the threes. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, your blitz will fail a little more often. So if he doesn't roll a 4 or a 1, 3 immediately, he might have a second chance at it next time. Right. Uh-huh. Exactly. Very Much good. A greater chance of it than he did before. Now, uh, you said we should talk about the different scores. If we put this into a more pure, uh, unlimited, or money game, yeah, so these yeah. plays don't change really, do they? Uh, no, but the magnitude does. And I think what's interesting, actually, is the difference in magnitude on this one. This was the interesting one, the, uh, is the 6-2 play. And uh, why is there such a big difference? Is uh, in value is just uh, conceptually, when we look at the hitting play and count up the blocks, there's, uh, when we go uh, show the final on that, is that uh, Kent Goulding is the first person I ever heard say this, that most positions can't handle six blocks. And uh, this one is, uh, it's, we're showing that it's a little touchy, even though there's a, some obvious huge benefits to doing this. It's, uh, it still is a little bit rich. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that he's got two checkers in the air and a blot on the ace point, and it's still close, tells us that actually the principle is pretty good. This is, I guess, what you'd call an exception that proves the rule. Prove meaning, you know, it kind of... Uh, stretching the issue a little bit to see if it's true or not, even at the extremes. Mm -hmm. They said, well, we found an exception, but it wasn't much of one. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It required an awful lot of stuff going for you. In yeah, fact, it, 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 Kent and your point are very right. With six blots around the board now, if Blue gets lucky and comes in, and you dance one time, which is 25% of the time, and Blue picks up a second checker, then Blue's going to be too good to double at a couple of rolls by like picking up all these blots. So that's the real downside risk. But at, at the score, that's why it was so big. The difference is now only less than 4%. And at the score, it was like a double blunder uh, not to uh, hit and because of partially of the gammon value difference, too. Exactly. You're looking at it right there when you were uh, hovering over uh, the gammons the opponent wins. Look at that big difference. You get 17 of them versus uh, about 10. Oh, but it didn't matter in the in the, uh, the score case. Yeah, yeah. When you were when your opponent's two away holding a two cube, uh, gammons are worth zero to you, so you don't care, and uh, you're much more likely to want to leave six blots around the board because if things go wrong, uh, you know they went wrong anyway. It doesn't matter whether you lost or lost the gammon. Uh, anything yeah. more to add on this uh, on this fascinating uh, study here, Mary? Yeah, one thing that uh, I found interesting to try was to to say that one of the advantages of the play is gone, which is that blot on the ace. We've pointed out how evil the blot on the ace is. Let's not pick it up, though, and put it in a great location, like we're on the five point. That would be awesome for the other guy. Let's just make it an extra spare. Like, that's going to swing the play, because we've really messed with it. That's going to be a huge swing in favor of uh, just making the five point and uh, pulling in your horns. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good point. And now, if you if you make the other play and you get hit, you don't have this checker looking at you. And also, when you come out with this checker, 
uh, he's got a builder, Blue's got a builder here to start clobbering this point too. And uh, But I found that actually even when I put it just as an extra spare on the six point, that it even then it's going to play. It's, uh, we didn't give him an extra builder. All we did was remove the liability. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I just changed it about one and a half percent. It's still very right to make the five point. Yes. Well, this uh, shows illustrates something else. The way Mary and I are doing this, uh, using extreme gamut and quickly getting the answer. Uh, when we, when I was learning this game, and I'm uh, quite a bit older than Mary, so I don't know. We may have been learning at the same time, though, because I started learning late, even though I started playing young. Uh, we had a, we didn't know the answers to these things. We had to try and roll them out by hand a few hundred times and probably got horrible answers because we played them wrong while we were playing them out. But we, because you have this ability to change the position, hit the button, change the score, hit the button, put the cube over here, do whatever, all these things, and quickly and instantly be able to compare the slight changes and variations, there's no reason why you can't be, become a lot more intelligent about the position. Now, keep in mind, the play that I had wasn't even the 6-2. It was a 6-1. But the more I learn about how you play the 6-2, the more I've learned about why it was right to play the 6-1 the way we did. So that's why you, you really need to work with variations and understand the entire situation, not just try to figure out what's right with that play. And by the way, when you get to a play like this, if you are wrong and you didn't understand it, there's another thing that you might well do that's a great exercise. Chart, start changing to every role. How do you play a 3-2? How do you play a 4-1? How do you play a 5-1? Go through all the roles and see, are you hitting? Are you playing safe? Are you coming out? Are you making the point? And then by the time you're done, you will really know this position and you're more likely to remember it over the board. Yes, I totally agree with Phil that... Uh the people that we learned to play with back in the day would be sick with envy if they knew what we have with XG here. The things that they spent whole and afternoon result, we, we did in five minutes. And as a result, uh, the, we have more really good players now. I, I mean, we had some great players 30 years ago, but the difference between the very top ones and the next level was, was tremendous. Now we have hundreds of players that are playing at 5 PR and below and 6 PR and below who who are playing a very, very strong game of backgammon who on any given day can beat anybody. And it's largely because uh, of, the, uh, of the use of these bots and doing it this way. So I hope this helped you not only understand the position, but understand how to use XG as a learning tool and also help to understand how, uh, how much to respect uh, Mary as a, as a teacher and lecturer. Next time you get a chance, be sure and uh, catch one of her articles. She writes a lot of great articles for the USBGF and uh, Gammon Village and, and uh, hopefully some other places in the future. And she's working on a second book right now. Is that right, Mary? Uh, well, third, if you count my book on CD, which is a compilation of the Chouette columns from Gammon Village. Yeah, I got that. Great. Okay, Mary, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, do a lot more of these together. Let me uh, click off here. I hope so. And uh, happy learning, everyone. <laughs>